Okay, we can uh, restart. Uh, and so Daniel has the task to keep us awake after the, <laughs> after after lunch. the lunch. Yes, I wish you good digestion and sleep during my talk. So, <laughs> so, so the <laughs> because it's the second philosophical talk. Here. Yes. <laughs> second philosophical, yeah. Daniel Schoch is from the University of Nottingham, uh, local campus. Yes. Please. Yes, um, my background is also, I'm. Yeah, I started as a physicist, and then I made a PhD in philosophy, and then I didn't get a job in philosophy. Um, I got one, but only for six years, and then I moved to economics because there is money in economics. And <laughs> yeah, of course. So now I'm here explaining how we get from this guy to that guy. It's, uh, it's actually a very nice idea. Also, it uh, gives you some idea how you can... Uh, find uh, maybe foundation, um, a foundation for economics as a science um, by doing experiments. Okay, so he started as a philosopher and he's the experimenter, the Vernon Smith, and uh, there you definitely have uh, empirical theories which can be falsified, which don't have theories which are so big that they uh, that the Durham, uh, Durham problem is, is uh, a great thing. So actually, uh, I think this could also be a way to overcome certain problems in economics. Now, the invisible hand, uh, who, anybody who does not believe in the invisible hand, okay, clearly is a metaphor. It must be a metaphor for something, but uh, I think all you believe it's there, but uh, can you point at it? Can you actually think of Nobody can say where, what it is, and so how do you deal with it in teaching? And because that's basically a uh, colloquium about education, I thought this is a good idea. Okay, so, uh, yeah, if the, if the hand is invisible, how do we know it's there? That's exactly the point here. So, we have to use methods. If the market is doing everything, and we are just seeing the results of the market, uh, then we can't obviously see the invisible hand. So we have to look deeper. So, and what we do in science is always we take something, uh, we, can, we can look at the world as it is, that's very fine, that's macroeconomics, that's like astronomy, we look at the, at the heaven as it is, nothing what we can change. The next step down is we can look at specific points of the world where something happens in a, in a certain way that it's just exactly the way how we would like to have uh, situate, have controlled uh, uh, situations. So that's called a field experiment. I will show you a very famous field experiment in my talk. Uh, and we can go one step further in controlling more variables is that putting people in a room like this on computers or even on an, uh, only with a teacher in a classroom experiment and that's a way how we, uh, how we can control more variables in time. So, uh, it has been claimed that the invisible hand is dead, and there is always, you would see people don't believe in the old classics again, and they say, that's, that's old theory, that's not any more relevant. And here, who is this guy, David S. Wilson, distinguished professor, he's distinguished, but of biology and anthropology, so perfectly qualified to speak about economics. I am not the first person to declare this notion of the invisible hand dead, but my ground for doing so are somewhat novel. Evolutionary theory can uh, makes it crystal clear that the unregulated pursuit of self-interested is often toxic for the common good. Uh, you may remember from the from your readings of Adam Smith, he linked actually, he said that the invisible hand makes the self-interest of, of the people work in a way that it works, it comes to a socially good outcome. Okay, so self-interest isn't often good. What way we can see in nearly all cooperative efforts require time, energy, and risk on part of cooperative individuals that place them at a relative disadvantage compared to less cooperative in the individuals within the group. So he speaks about cooperation. Can anybody see the mistake he made? Anybody has an idea where's the mistake here? So he's speaking about the invisible hand, which refers to market, and he's speaking to uh, cooperation, which refers to games, a certain sort of games. And there's a big difference, okay? So, of course, Adam Smith is the last one to say that unfettered self-interests are good for the society. Uh, he, he never said that, and his first book, 
uh, I think in 59, 1759, uh, he wrote the theory of moral sentiments. That was a moral philosopher. That's what, what we have paid for. He's not an economist. He, he just made himself his chair. He converted his chair to, a chair of, to the first chair of economists, if you want like that. And so he became an economist, but by, uh, by employment he wasn't. So now non-cooperation, what uh, the other guy referred to, that occurs in non-cooperative games. And you know them, all the prisoners dilemma, everybody knows that. Public good games, everybody knows that. Here each player has a strictly dominant strategy to defect. Okay? There's no other action could be feasible. So the interesting thing, okay, sometimes you have some uh, cooperation in public good games at the beginning, but it goes down. So uh, national equilibrium is very often played in the long run. Okay? That's something what we can find out empirically in experimental economics. So when there's a national equilibrium and it's not efficient, then this game is bad. Okay? It shouldn't be played the way it is, because the outcome could be bad. So now, what think, okay, let's be better people, and that works really in this case. Altruism is indeed a remedy to non-cooperation in public good game. You can just see, uh, maybe in this, in the, um, it's easy to see for prisoner's dilemma, you just see the matrix, this uh, uh, inefficient Nash equilibrium immediately disappears when you make everybody care about everybody else. Okay, then we have a, then we have, everybody has the same outcome, everybody has the same interest, it must be a cooperative game. Clearly there's no more, no more inefficient Nash equilibrium in dominated strategies. Okay, that's the remedy. Okay, fine. But pure exchange market, and that's what I will be talking about only today, so I will leave half of the economy side out, and generally those, this is the side of the economy which is more interesting to, uh, to the people coming from more uh, right, right wing, but also from left wing political uh, uh, theory. Uh, I, I look at the consumer side of the theory. I'm looking only at the edge work books, only at a situation where we have markets, everybody is endowed with some goods, and now people start to exchange freely uh, um, uh, and voluntarily. Uh, um, Okay, so these type of games are not the same type of games like these. They're not co non-cooperative games. So first of all, there's a co cooperative component because every deal is better than no deal. And but the most uh, important thing is all deals are at equilibrium are Pareto efficient. So when the deals stop and no more, you don't have any possibilities to deal any further then by definition almost you are at a Pareto efficient state. There's no more exchange which is uh, benefic beneficial for both people. So now clearly uh, there are the nearest type of games to that is bargaining games. And bargaining games can fail, okay? Uh, but the, they can fail, for example, the ultimatum game they can, uh, offers can be rejected if they are too low, so they often fail in this case. People try to break off the deal even at high costs, even if so this is completely irrational, okay, because even a small win, a pose, any positive win is better and should be accepted. Now, the, efficient, the, uh, extreme thing that, uh, the interesting thing is that is not the reason why market fails, okay? So actually also the preference don't matter actually for the market. Whether you are selfish or, al or altruistic doesn't make a difference in pure exchange market. Not much, okay? It cannot make a difference with respect to efficiency, which is considered the size of the cake. I'm not aware of any study which shows uh, whether there's a, uh, actually um, a difference in how the cake is split, because also that, the split of the cake is more or less uh, dictated by the supply and demand curve and the, and, and the equilibrium. And experiments show that it it's very much comes out the way as neoclassical neo -classic, neo economics says it to come out of the market. Okay, so 
the old paradigm was teaching. How was uh, um, the market being taught, the equilibrium in the market being taught in the old days? Now you have the very old idea, already one of the uh, 1870 pig pioneers had the idea that there was some kind of haggling involved, somebody shouting out prices. Uh, um, <coughs> and uh, this is called the Valoration Auctioneer. Um, and the problem is that when we look at it from a mathematical point, there might not always be such a tetramont process which converges to a stable equilibrium. And also the auctioneer is not a replacement to the, to the hand, to Adam Smith's hand, because it's invisible. It's not, nowhere to be seen. So this can't be the hand, this can't be the invisible hand. Then the second, so people switch to over, now people have to be somewhere, have somehow rational, and uh, everybody knows everything about the market, at least demand and supply, and so they can guess the equilibrium price. Well, that's a bold assumption, uh, because it requires not only perfectly rational market participants, but common, perfect market knowledge. So how this, should this come about? Now, you can't really test that one in, in the real market. To test that one, you have to put it in a lab and control the information. And then you know if markets still work with private information, okay, then you know that the assumption about information, common known information in the market is grossly overstated, so says Vernon Smith. So the problem, uh, yeah, of course with that approach is that the number of omniscient beings in the university is strictly limited. Uh, most of us agree there's at most one, and uh, so that, that one can't make up a market, so this idea isn't very feasible. Okay, so we start with the beginning of, of actually Chamber the experimental economics that is normally in the textbook regarded as the first classroom experiment. So every student will be assigned a role. So we could play it here just directly. Here are the buyers, there are the sellers, and I will give you private values. So every one of the buyer has a private value, okay? That which is privately known to him only. Every one of the seller has a private cost which is known to him only. Now, of course. Some of the costs are lower than some of the values. So in some, some of the matchings could be matching for a deal. Some other matchings could be not a matching for a deal. Uh, and altogether, if, if, uh, if actually if it comes out that everybody, every possible deal which could be made is actually being made, then the market is 100% efficient. Okay. Now, what did Edward Chamberlain make? Okay, he let his uh, students, um, yeah, they are given up, they are actually being paid off uh, by the difference. So when they make a deal at a certain price, P, P for example, your cost is $1. Um, um, Carmelo's private value is $3. You make a deal of two, both of you have earned $1. That's what you're given out. Uh, now, the problem in this market was every student was running around and meeting every other student, and they were trying out to uh, settle the market, and it turned out to be inefficient. Well, that result was published, but it was no concern for anybody. Uh, <coughs> the invisible hand was somehow absent from this classroom, so. Um, at least there we have a condition where there's no invisible hand. Uh, so what is different in real markets? Um, well, that was to be found out by one student sitting there, and his name was Vernon L. Smith. Okay, but before we come to him, I will go a few years before Chamberlain's experiment, because there was a field experiment. That means a situation in real life economics uh, which was played in German POW camps um, by captivated U.S. soldiers. And I think you know all that by the name of Radford. He took notes and it was published in Econometrica in 1945. You're all aware of this paper? 
Okay. Soldiers were initially endowed with no. equal. So uh, I know. we are not. Okay, you're not. Okay, good. So um, that's why I'm explaining. Okay. Uh, so this Redford experiment so is in many textbooks. Uh, so actually, soldiers were initially endowed with equal Red Cross food parcels. So you receive every week, you receive a package, and there are several tins inside made of food, and that's what you can eat. You can eat it, but there are often, obviously there are Hindu uh, soldiers, six soldiers, for example, they don't want to eat the beef, they want to trade away the beef. There are other soldiers who uh, don't like the marmalade, or uh, then there's some food which is uh, actually very valuable, others is not so valuable. So at the beginning, everyone was trading with everybody, and then that was like a Chamberlain's experiment, and the outcome was similar. Okay, so the story really uh, was preceded here. Stories circulated of a padre, says Redford, who started off round the camp with a tin of cheese and five cigarettes and turned, returned to his bed with a complete parcel in addition to his original cheese and cigarettes. So here must made to have some very good deals. But if you find out like this, okay, this is not a, definitely not the Pareto improvement. So money, somebody has been, <laughs> has been making profit here. Okay, as you know, in a, in a Walrasian market, uh, the value of the goods you exchange is exactly the value of what you could get back, which is not possible if you add a complete parcel, which is definitely not of value zero. Okay, so there's definitely nothing like a Walrasian equilibrium. Okay. Now, after one, some weeks, something emerged, and uh, that's what we call a one-sided auction in, uh, that arose with, and cigarettes were forming as a numeria, which is interesting because you could, some soldiers chose to literally burn money by smoking. Um, so people started by wandering through the bungalows, calling their offers, cheese for seven. Okay, that means seven cigarettes. So the, the point is here that only one side is calling out offers and the other side has to accept it. Okay, this is the situation we have, for example, in supermarkets. Now, uh, spoiler alert, these markets are not optimal. In the long run, if everything else is stable, they can get a, a high level of efficiency. But introducing shops or anything like that, they are not very resistant to that. Okay, so they're not optimal markets. Um, several weeks later, there was another improvement. Oh, um, am I already so late? Um, sorry, uh, I have to speed up. Several weeks later, there was a, an even better mechanism, an exchange Change and Mart Notice Board was established in every bungalow where under the heading name, room number, wanted and offered sales and ones were advertised. That's called a double-sided auction. As both buyers and sellers can make spit and offers. Now if you do that in the classroom, that's very efficient. And by our best knowledge, both by theory and by experiments, that's the most efficient types of markets. Have we found the invisible hand? Is it a notice book? It has something to do with it. And a double option can also be executed orally in the classroom with the teacher writing down bits and ask on a blackboard. Okay? The teacher is not a Walrasian auctioneer. He's not a central agent calling out prices. He's just making notes. He's just like a noteboard. Okay? So he only notices that the deal is made when somebody when some offer is being accepted. Okay, then all the other previous bits are erased and the new round starts. So, <laughs> prices are learned from the market. The public and permanent records of transactions led to cigarette prices being well known and thus tending to equality throughout the camp. Also, there, was, there were always opportunities for an astute trader to make a profit from arbitrage across bungalows. Okay, so in a certain bungalow, you had certain market prices. So the interesting thing, the market has to be first, then an equilibrium is reached, and then you learn the prices. 
That's very important. This is the way how it works, not the other way around. Not guessing the prices and shouting out the prices and looking if it works. No, it's the other way around. And it's difficult, he said, Redford, to reconcile this fact with the labor theory of value. I think that's key. Uh, no knowledge of demand or supply is needed to ensure equilibrium formation. That was later confirmed by Vernon Smith in his classroom experiments, where values and costs were known only in private. Okay? And repeated the A markets are very, double auction markets, are very efficient from the first period. A slight learning effect can be seen by a reduction of volatility. You see here, this is the famous slide from his 1962 paper. You see people were making deals at low prices, but yeah, unfortunately the, uh, the price itself isn't so relevant for the efficiency. The efficiency here already is over 90%. And later in period it comes to 98 or 100%. That is often being found. People should not trade at losses. Okay, and the volatility tend to be slowing down when you repeat the same market with the same uh, private costs and values often and often. So there is a small learning effect. Okay, so the information about past deals seem to make a difference between the experiments of Smith and Chamberlain, but indeed presentation of information like historical bits asked spread can improve convergence in the equilibrium price. However, as with price learning, market efficiency is hardly improved since it's already high. You start with a high, very high level and you see that the closing price here is almost always very close to the equilibrium or at equilibrium. And this is due to the, to the type of the market design here. Okay. That is now the, there's a now a twist of the market. Um, um, which questions the role of rationality in market efficiency. Imagine monkeys on a keyboard. Can they trade efficiently? When actually price, when actually bits and asks, consider bits and asks uh, randomly generated by a computer. And that is the outcome. And here, only deals which are not at loss are being made. And you see, Okay, there's, there's not much of a conversion, there's no learning effect, but definitely uh, this is relatively close to equilibrium. Now, if people make losses, then the, the prices at which deals are made are going wild. They're going actually to the roof. Okay, so the computer simulated the A markets where agents have no memories and do not form beliefs. Uh, when you trade at losses, when you follow the market rules, the only self-interest, we found the invisible hand here. Then, the, in the DA mechanism together with the discipline not to trade at losses, arising from self-interest. So this is the invisible hand. It's the double option mechanism, uh, a good market mechanism together with the only thing which is from, from giving from self-interest. And self-interest is there for altruistic and for non-altruistic people. Okay. So, why are they so good? They are almost automatically highly efficient, independently of how smart the traders are. The closing price is almost sure like near the equilibrium. There's not much what can wrong. People can trade at losses. That's a, they are, for this type of market, a painful feedback. Missed opportunities can happen when people do not come together, or the wrong people come together and trade, and then for example, one is blocking a good trade. So, for example, uh, you, are, uh, at, you have a value at $3, you're buying from somebody who has costs of uh, $1, while there's another one who has 50 cent cost, which would be better to buy from because the cake to split is bigger. Okay? So, that only, the good news holds only for static items, and in, if in the most harmless dynamic asset markets, uh, produce high bubbles. That is one of these markets. And here this asset has a deterministic payoff. Every round it's a fixed dividend of say two dollars. And then you know if there are let's say uh, eight rounds to go, it's eight times two is sixteen dollars the whole thing is value. Now these are the prices. They're going berserk. They are huge overpricing. An asset uh, there's no risk involved, and there's especially no speculative demand here, as assets could not be resold. 
So people fail to realize the unique and sure fundamental value and trade at sure losses. So they make mistake number one. They are noise traders of the bad type who lack the market discipline. They simply over trade. If you can make further, further experiment, you can keep them busy by letting them do any other stupid task, for example, like dealing, uh, trading on another market, their, uh, their behavior will improve when they were kept busy. So uh, they are just sitting on their, on their computer and making too many trades. And these public bubbles are stubbornly persistent. I'm speaking of non-speculative bubbles. So learning from experience is short-lived. And moreover, classical regulations fail. And specifically, the favorite of the left one, financial transaction tax, total and complete failure, both in theory and in reality. We can speak about this in the discussion. Short sellings, yeah, they can drive the price down, but they too, too much of the good, then you have underpricing. Uh, cash endowments, you put more cash into the market and all of these regulations already will be, uh, will be weakened. Okay, that's, so how realistic is the invisible habit paradigm? The good institution achieves the socially good outcome, whether it's optimal or efficient, whatever that means, with, even with selfish actors, uh, as long as they do not trade at losses. Good institutions are defined through rules and discipline. They require a certain level of organization and design. In DA markets, we have found such an institution. It produces good matching of buyers and sellers, where the final ma marginal trade uh, line between uh, is both likely being close to equilibrium. And by the best of our knowledge, from theory, experiment, and real world experience, they are the optimal market designs. The term invisible hands is best exposed, approximated by good market institutions, so Vernon Smith vindicates Adam Smith. Thank you.